Hello, everybody, and welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time we have Jeremy Eater um, from Red Hat, who's going to talk to us about the path to cloud native trading platforms. And um, this comes out of some of the work he's been doing with the Red Hat Performance Engineering um, Group and a lot of um, interest in this topic and um, the work we've been doing with NVIDIA as well. But I'll let um, Jeremy introduce himself and the topic. We can do chat in the um, chat, questions in the chat rather, and then we'll have live Q&A at the end. So Jeremy, go ahead, um, take it away. Hi, my name is Jeremy Eater. Yep, I work in the Red Hat Performance Engineering team, um, and I concentrate on OpenShift. What I have today is a presentation um, on how we can use some of the new features in Kubernetes and in OpenShift to deploy a, uh, a benchmark that is focused on uh, Wall Street workload, low latency networking, and essentially the, the, the summary is how can we bring some of those high performance workloads onto, onto a container, pl container orchestration platform. Um, so I'll start with that as the summary. And uh, one interesting thing, and this slide comes from um, one of the product manager slides from, the, from Red Hat Summit this year, it's interesting to note that Red Hat or adoption of OpenShift itself is is pretty hot and heavy in the financial world. Um, not necessarily for these super high performance workloads yet, because we we're still building the features. But that ecosystem is interested in in you know productized, enterprise ready a version of Kubernetes, which is uh, what OpenShift is. So here's some logos from that segment. Percentage standpoint, you can see financial services represents currently over one third of the sales of OpenShift. So um, hopefully this talk is applicable to that group. And uh, in addition to just the percentages of business at Red Hat's event in San Francisco, Red Hat Summit in, uh, in May, there's an OpenShift Commons Day that preceded the summit itself. And uh, there was a panel related specifically to financial services customers uh, during that OpenShift Commons gathering. And uh, <clears throat> one last thing I'll mention is that Red Hat's participating in a new community called the FinOS community, which is uh, attempting to spearhead more usage of open source in a financial services vertical. So, quick description of OpenShift and the, uh, the unified platform with CoreOS, our recent acquisition of CoreOS at the end of January 2018. Red Hat provides a full end-to-end -end stack, including the operating system, Kubernetes distribution, operations framework, monitoring metrics, logging, and so forth to assemble a complete, uh, a complete platform to run your applications. Left to right, uh, you can also modulate OpenShift between a container as a service platform and a platform as a service. And what I'm gonna show you today is more about uh, container as a service rather than using some of the higher level CI, CD tooling that um, will come with time, but is just not part of this demo. So uh, those some of those more platform as a service traditional kind of features. Okay, so <clears throat> what the backstory here is uh, that we a couple of years ago identified a gap in upstream Kubernetes or in the container orchestration ecosystem as a whole in addressing running some performance sensitive workloads on OpenShift or on Kubernetes. And this pretty little diagram on the right is the extent to my graphics design skills, but it represents essentially that some survey results that uh, we talked to. A, quite a few customers in different industry verticals and found that a lot of them who were running applications in, uh, in production and wanted to move to a more flexible substrate uh, had a lot of overlapping requirements. And so we did a bunch of surveys and site visits and a lot of conversations and those continue to this day. The upstream efforts centered around creation of a community that would address performance sensitive applications and then eventually plumbing all of those features in a way that uh, helped all of those workloads. At the same time, we wanted to retain what makes Kubernetes great, and that's the fact that it's um, it's, it's extremely flexible, and um, uh, we didn't want to reinvent some of the existing patterns that work that our customers mentioned to us are too rigid and difficult to maintain. We wanted to we wanted to uplift their day to day experience by adding you know the Kubernetes um, features to their existing workloads. So the upstream community centered around resource management working group and another working group I'll mention in a second. Um, OpenShift 310 
was released yesterday. In that release, we have three new features that relate to performance sensitive applications. And there's a blog up on uh, redhat.com that talks about them in a, in a, in a little bit of detail. Um, but today I'll go into a little bit more. Device plugin, CPU manager, and huge pages support, which was added by Derek Carr of Red Hat. And then some of the other stuff was done by the community, Google, Intel, NVIDIA, um, IBM. A lot of uh, community participation from other vendors who are interested in running similar workloads on Kubernetes. So this effort started quite a while ago when we're finally able to offer you know, GA levels of support of these features, which I'll show demos of in a, in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> so once we've got, that's the compute and memory side of things. Um, of course, a workload also has you know, network aspects to it and also storage aspects to it. So the next area we're focusing on is, is the networking side. And one of the key things to understand about Kubernetes in its initial, you know, the way it is uh, upstream now is that each pod has a single interface and all pods in the system share a single interface um, in terms of uh, physical interfaces, right? So what we wanted to do was help our customers address an additional set of use cases that were like fast data plane workloads, whether it's telecom or distributed deep learning, anything that, or, or video streaming, uh, a lot of those workloads have huge network performance requirements and in the past have used a variety of optimization techniques. Well, in order to onboard those workloads, we have to provide equal or better performance. So we need to add some features to, to Kubernetes or to the plugin ecosystem around Kubernetes that provide these sorts of capabilities. And so what we've done is Red Hat and IBM and Google, of course, um, gotten together to create a, a set of uh, pseudo standards or de facto standards, we're calling them, a collection of CRDs, which are custom resource definitions, and ways to extend Kubernetes um, using the Multis CNI plugin. So we're going down that road for now. And with the target user stories being, as I mentioned, fast data plane, multi-homed pods, and pretty simple one, the separation of the control plane from uh, the data plane networks. So that's what that working group's focused on. And these links here, these, this, this presentation has links to the um, ways to get in contact with uh, or, or to participate in those, in those groups, which I would, I would definitely encourage anyone listening to do. Um, in the last year, we've done a couple of things. I'll show demos of all of these in a few minutes. Um, all these are GA except for uh, sys control support, which remains in tech preview. Um, extended resource is not intended to be used directly, but is a building block for device plugins. So, and I'll, I will show a demo of that in a minute as well. Um, we know that we're not done. There's more to be done. Um, we have Red Hat and the ecosystem have a lot of work on our plate. One of them is uh, handling you know, hardware topology in a system uh, to optimize performance even further. One of them is uh, a resource API to, to allow you to select more granularly on what hardware that you schedule to. Um, for example, if I want to schedule to a certain model GPU versus another, or a certain model NIC versus another, that's currently not possible. And we'll, we're gonna try and make that level of granularity po uh, uh, possible in, in Kubernetes and eventually OpenShift. We have a multi, I would call this, yeah, I mean, none of these things happen overnight. They take careful design. Another one that's ongoing is the um, some changes around the existing CPU manager to make it friendly to ISIL CPUs, which it currently is not. And I'll share some benchmark results that uh, indicate what the problem is there. So that's the platform level stuff. Um, to demonstrate some of these tech, uh, some of these new features, Vanko Kosic, who I, I'm not sure if he's joined, I can't see the blue jeans, but he led this project to onboard a financial services benchmark into OpenShift. Uh, Svanko, have you joined? I'm here, Jeremy. Okay. Did you want to go into some of the details around, um, hopefully you can see the slides here, around, around this benchmark? Yeah, sure. Um, so we, we had two configurations. Um, we started with a bare metal to have uh, some, some baseline, and we got this new Solafra Extreme Scale adapters um, with super microservers. 
We were running on bare metal with uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.5. Um, after we established our baseline on bare metal, we um, dupl duplicated a complete benchmark uh, on, on OpenShift. Um, the same hardware, but with uh, OpenShift 3.10. Um, we developed a new device plugin for the stack N and a pre-start hook, which makes the solar flare hardware available into the into the containers. Um, it's it's built like the NVIDIA pre-start hook. I, I believe where where he left off was that you know we had this bare metal deployment which served as a baseline, and then we containerized uh, the benchmark itself, which. You know, had never been done before, so that took a, a significant effort. Um, Monko created device plugins, and he was mentioning pre-start hooks. And what those are are uh, things that run before a pod is is executed by the uh, container runtime. So Red Hat's version of Docker and uh, Cryo both support pre-start hooks. Um, interestingly, the upstream Docker uh, did not accept those PRs, so I don't believe they support them now. But anyway, those pre-start hooks provide uh, the kernel bypass libraries into the into the uh, container containers that have the benchmark in them. So this uh, SolarFlare provides as a network adapter vendor that provides a kernel bypass uh, library called Open Onload. And uh, in order to mount those libraries from the host into the pod, we use this pre-start hook. Um, that is more than an implementation detail. It, 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 well, it is an implementation detail, but it's an important part to know about what it takes to onboard these. Um, the, the use of these kernel bypass adapters into into OpenShift. So, uh, what we're zooming in on here are the Snowflake nodes towards the bottom. This is the, the logical diagram of an OpenShift cluster topology. You've got your control plane, the infrastructure nodes, and then you've got the compute nodes and potentially a storage tier if you um, are running one. The Snowflakes on the bottom, there, you know, that's just meant to represent there's something special about those nodes. In this case, it is I have a solar flare network adapter in them. And they're also highly optimized in terms of uh, operating system tuning. So the second uh, deployment in OpenShift, this is a logical diagram of how a pod gets scheduled. Our, the interesting part is on the left blue column or a left blue box there, this, this area of the pod spec, section of an existing of a pod spec that we created, the resources field, the limits field now contains the solarflare.com slash SFC colon one. And what that does is it the device plugin surfaces the number of NICs that are available on a system, so it discovers the hardware, and then it publishes that to the capacity and allocatable fields within the node spec itself. And then that event that information eventually gets up to this to the cube scheduler itself. So that when a pod create comes in that requests one of these devices, the cube scheduler knows which node has them, which node has some available, and uh, and then schedules them. You know, so the pod ends up on a node that has that hardware. Then the Kubelet's job, the Atomic OpenShift node process's job, is to glue those things together. Is to take the the hardware, the C groups, do the C group juggling, uh, and eventually the the um, container runtime. And the pre-start hook makes sure that the bypass libraries are available inside the pod so that the application can, um, can take advantage of those. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, and just checking, I don't know if Zonko rejoined. Mm, no, I do not see him. Okay, so here is a, uh, here is a logical diagram of the the benchmark pods themselves. We had two physical machines, in this case a producer, which sends traffic, and a consumer, which reads traffic, and in this scenario actually uh, reflects it back to the producer. So it's it's a ping pong type of a benchmark over, over uh, the network, Ethernet. So we've got producer pods, consumer pods, and the solar flare device plugin. And you'll note here that down on the bottom, our pods are actually on the host network. And that requires the pods to be privileged. And there's a couple of, uh, there's obviously that requires the whole thing to have more privileges than it's than it really should for an application. But to be fair, these pods, when they run in, on bare metal outside of OpenShift are already running um, as a root. So it's not really a regression in terms of security. It's just not as good as we had hoped to provide 
So that's why we're working through the network plumbing working group to make it possible to uh, uh, to represent data networks in Kubernetes so that we can say in this pod, in addition to having a solar flare NIC, I also want to be on you know, this, this network. Let's say I have networks yellow, blue, and red. I want to be on the blue network, for example, and it will um, find a node that matches all of those constraints and launch the pod there. So there's some, again, there's a roadmap here, but this is how the, the uh, benchmark deployment. And some of the results, a um, couple of like world beating numbers here. We did have some overclock super micro servers. And uh, uh, so the, the, the CPUs were running, I think at 4.1 or 4.2 gigahertz. Um, the memory was as, you know, as fast as they sell these days. And, um, and we tuned the systems like crazy. So we were able to find, we were able to get some, some uh, new world records for this particular benchmark. And all you're seeing on the graph here on the right is uh, some statistical analysis of the, of the data itself. So for example, the um, mean latency here between two machines for certain packet size was 2.3 microseconds. And that's actually the one that was, um, that was the uh, the world record there, and that's 100,000 messages per second. So, um, and then the max latency there was uh, just just 10 microseconds, which is which is great for software. There there are faster solutions which are kind of FPGA based generally, um, but for software and for you know user space networking, this is um, current state of the art. So that's the bare metal scenario, and uh, if you can just keep some of those maximums in your head, you'll understand some of the some of what I said earlier around you know, how we have to uh, handle ISIL CPUs. Um, so the benchmark for uh, OpenShift is presented here. And, and what, I've, what I've trimmed off of this graph is actually the maximums. Those are somewhere in the 30 microseconds. Um, and uh, the delta between them ends up being some jitter introduced by the way that Kubelet currently coordinates um, process scheduling. So we do have excellent numbers somewhere in the 2.0 Four, so essentially 2.4 or 2.3 microseconds, so essentially exactly what bare metal gave us for the mean latencies. Uh, but once you step up into the, you know, three nines, four nines, five nines, um, and maximums, you'll start seeing outliers. And those outliers are where our future activity is going to be focused, getting rid of those. Okay. So there's a whole blog that goes into a ton more of the detail around what this, what it took to set this thing up. Before I go on to some of the demos, I wanted to stop for questions, um, if there are any, or I can uh, just start off with some demos. I had one question, Jeremy. Sure. Uh, this is Diane Fetima. When you mentioned the FPGAs in the financial industry, who designs those? Do they actually em employ electrical engineers or engineers to program them those FPGAs? Who does that work? There's, I, mean, I know it's kind of out of the, it's out of scope question, but I, No, it's, a, it, I mean, when we go to these stack events, it's full of those type of people. So I'll just quickly describe what happens when we, and we will do FPGA benchmarks on OpenShift. Uh, it's just a matter of um, finding a FPGA vendor that wants to do one because these are not cheap, but <clears throat> basically there's two different types of, of banks. There's ones that are big enough to employ their own, Verilog designers and so forth, and there's ones that want something off the shelf. And so for off the shelf, there are a whole ecosystem of, of FPGA vendors that do the hard lifting of implementing basically UDP, um, a UDP stack on an FPGA and providing an SDK for your matching engine to, to tie into. So um, you, you can employ them if you can afford it, essentially. <laughs> okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, and and oh, so many banks are yeah. writing Verilog. It's amazing to me. Just well, because it's that edge that doing it in hardware gives them that edge to trade faster. That's what they're looking for. Yeah, and that, so that number, two point three microseconds, would be, you know, maybe even an, a full order of magnitude too slow for some of the applications. And to 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 lower it a full order of magnitude, it's not something that software can handle, or, or even that CPUs can handle. Got so, it. Makes so, sense. Yeah, yeah. So they implement whatever they can in FPGA, and there's there's limitations around how much can be done in hardware due to the memory limits of those devices, so forth. But uh, so anyway, the whole ecosystem has spun up around serving that need because it's difficult to find developers who are qualified in so many different areas to 
to uh, be able to develop those, you know, that logic. So I think we might have Zvanko back. Um, if he unmutes himself, he may be able you know, to add some color as well. Zvanko, you want to add in any color or feedback? No, he just muted again. He's having some technical difficulties with the mute and unmute button um, and and devices. So um, yeah, he's a little frustrated. We'll have him on again, um, perhaps uh, by himself, to, to talk about some of the, the benchmarking um, at a later date. Then um, when we get that, maybe if he dials in with his phone. So uh, go ahead, Brian. Uh, not Brian. Uh, Jeremy, uh, continue then. Well, I was looking for if there are any other questions. Um, I can get, I can minimize this presentation now and, and, and show you some demos here. Um, before I do that, I'll mention that uh, we also were involved with a bench, a different benchmark, not a networking one. This was risk analytics on uh, NVIDIA GPUs. We did this one in the fall to prove out last fall, um, gosh, almost a year ago, already nine months. Uh, to prove out the fact some of the new upstream work, which was all alpha, none of this stuff was supported even in even in upstream Kubernetes. And so it's taken a, you know that length of time to productize all of these features and, and you know lift them up to the GA level. Um, some of the blogs linked there at the bottom. We used you know at this at that time those Volta uh, Nvidia Volta cards were brand new, impossible to find. We were lucky to have a machine with eight of them. Um, and uh, and we just ran these benchmarks, which which incidentally were all uh, were all you know setting world records across those benchmarks as well. And most of that was due to the faster Volta platform versus the previous uh, GPUs that things ran on. So, but that was the first time that benchmark was run on Kubernetes or any containers uh, orchestration solution as well. So, um, and that was done mostly by Vikas Chowdhury on uh, on our team as well. Also, with some assist from myself and, and Zvanko. So, just credit to the whole team for bringing these things up. It is not an easy process. Okay, so I teased a bit some demos, and um, I'll, I'll show you a couple of them now, done by Derek Carr or myself uh, for, for Red Hat Summit this year. So, let's see if I, if, do you see the screen now? Should be all black. Um, can you see some text at the top there? Yep, a little small, but we, we'll deal with it. Okay, sorry about that. So what what we're showing here is the ability to do static CPU assignment. Um, what we have to do is first change the node configuration to um, to activate what's called the static CPU manager policy. And he's going into the config map for the node itself. Incidentally, and I'll pause it here because this bears this bears a little bit of a deep dive. Is um, in OpenShift 3.10, the configuration for a node has moved into a config map. It used to be in a flat file somewhere in uh, Etsy origin. Now it's in a config map. So what you're going to see our, uh, Derek do in a minute is is actually edit that uh, edit that config map. So we've got a couple of pods running, and we're going to show that the Redis pod itself uh, is will, will run on any one of the two cores in this VM. So here you can see, and I'll pause it. If you look at the CPU set for that Redis pod, uh, you'll see it can run on any one of the two. Again, there's only two cores in this VM, so zero through one is all there. All there uh, is the full set of, of cores. So if we change that configuration, or if, sorry, if we look at a different pod, uh, the PHP pod that was running at this point, you can see, oops, it went too fast, but there's a there was a quality of service tier as well that was on there. And if you use the uh, if you if you use the CPU manager to allocate pods in your pods or to allocate cores in your pod spec, you automatically get into what's called the guaranteed quality of service tier. So there's guaranteed 
best effort and burstable quality of service uh, tiers in Kubernetes. And uh, so the last thing in this demo is if we look in this PHP pod, which already had its pod spec updated to request one core, you can see this one has, uh, in its CPU set, it only has one core rather than zero and one. So by default, and this is the important thing to know about some of the future work we're doing, by default, any pod will have access to all the cores. And that's okay for most workloads. It's not okay for performance workloads or for, for performance sensitive workloads, like the stack benchmark um, or like real world, you know, financial services workloads or telecom workloads and so forth, um, machine learning. And uh, so what we wanted to do was create a way to select individual or to select dedicated cores. And what this has done in the background, it's not part of the demo, but it has pulled that, that one, that number one core uh, out of the global set of cores that Kubernetes, the Kubelet will schedule to. So if you look at any other core, uh, sorry, if you look at the CPU set in, in the Redis pod, and I apologize, I don't think this is in the demo, it will no longer say 0-1, it will say 0 because the core number one has now been exclusively allocated for the this PHP pod. So that's what it does. This static CPU, uh, static CPU manager policy will pull certain, you know, whole cores out of the total set in the system and allocate them for certain workloads. Uh, okay, so that's the one demo. Any thoughts or questions on that one? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, so perhaps motor on. So what we're gonna do is, is teach this CPU manager to obey the kernel command line ISIL CPUs option. So if you normally what happens with these workloads is you'll have you know a handful of cores set aside for the housekeeping on the on the host, and then you'll have a set of isolated cores where the applications run. Um, and right now it doesn't coordinate with the ISIL CPUs option. So it, it actually schedules you know work, including itself, including the including the kubelet itself, to to any of any of the cores that are isolated that would have otherwise been isolated at the at the kernel level. So that's a piece of coordination we need to do upstream and there is a uh, a kubernetes enhancement proposal a cap that was opened by intel uh, to start considering the design of that feature um, that was just opened this week see some messages coming in the chat here oops I think we're mostly just mind blown here um, and listening. <laughs> okay, um, we, let's go to the next one. Uh, let me see here, did I get it right? Doing them out of order here. I may have closed that other window. Okay, here we go. So this one is on huge pages. And if you're not familiar, huge pages are a pretty common optimization technique for large memory consuming applications. It helps reduce TLB, transaction look aside buffer misses in the, kernel, in the uh, CPU and thereby accelerate memory, um, memory access. So virtual memory address lookup is specifically what is accelerated by these. And what it does is it increases the uh, size of a memory page in Linux from 512 to, uh, to two megabytes, 512 bytes to 200, um, sorry, to two megabytes. We also have support for one gig huge pages when uh, uh, on, on processors that have that support. So more modern processors support two different sizes of huge pages. Um, and I should say I'm talking about x86 here. Okay, so I'll hit play on this demo. And what we're gonna do, what, what Derek has chosen to do in this demo is use a daemon set to allocate the, uh, to allocate the huge pages on the, on the node itself. Um, we have another pattern in mind that we're gonna potentially productize. It will look a lot like this. There so, there was so much in the world. Um, yeah, anyway, so let's keep going. There, uh, he's chosen a daemon set to allocate huge pages. And uh, so he's got a list of notes here. On the node itself, you can see, sorry, I'm just hitting pause here um, so I can show you stuff. So if you look at the capacity and allocatable fields on the left here, 
I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm circling around them. Um, you've got huge pages, one gig, and huge pages, two meg. And you can see there that there are zero available on the system. And that's because they haven't been allocated at the operating system level yet. So if you were to look at OpenShift 3.9 and you were just to do OC described node, you would not see these. But in OpenShift 3.10, you will, you will begin to see these huge pages fields in capacity and allocatable. They're on, they're on by default. So he's got a daemon set to pre-allocate these huge pages. We're going to do it with 2 and D um, in, when we go to like the real world. And uh, because that's, you know, Red Hat's thing. He's got to restart the, the kubelet here to pick up those changes. This is an important thing we're going to try and fix upstream, but is not ready yet. <clears throat> he showed you the script that's inside the daemon set. That's not important. It's an implementation detail anyway. Once this allocator pod starts up, um, we're going to describe the node again, and you will see how uh, the capacity and allocatable fields have been updated with the new uh, the new values there. Okay, so I'll, I'll try and sneak in here and hit pause. Yeah, so you can see that there's one gigabyte of two meg huge pages available now. So here's what this is. I mentioned before that we have a new feature called extended resources. This was added by Intel, I want to say, in 1.6 or 1.7, some time frame like that. Huge pages and the device plugin all leverage extended resources, which are a way to teach the kubelet about a new widget, about a new thing. In this scenario, it's huge pages. And in the case of Zvonko's um, stack benchmark, he created a device plugin that taught the Kubelet about solar flare devices. NVIDIA has another plugin that teaches the Kubelet about NVIDIA hardware and so forth. And Mellanox has uh, some prototypes. And the, incidentally, the Kubevert team um, has built several device plugins to, to, uh, that they're going to use in the Kubevert project, which is how to, how to run full-on virtual machines on top of Kubernetes. They're using the device plugin feature to do that. Anyway. Here you see one gig of, of huge pages available from a scheduling standpoint. So here's the thing. When you go through and have a pod that asks now for uh, X number of huge pages, the number of nodes that are targets to, be, to have it be scheduled to are shrunk because only certain, pod, only certain nodes have huge pages allocated and presented to the scheduler through this capacity field. Jeremy, I have a question. Sure. So um, do you generally just look at your improvement in throughput when you're using huge pages, or do you actually look at your TLB, a reduction in your TLB misses? Is there a metric that's reported that shows you your TLB? Yeah, perf, there are perf counters for the TLB if you appear to. So, so Diana is asking about um, how do you measure the improvements of using huge pages. Really what I just showed is the fact that you can use them, so more of a functional benchmark. Uh, um, actual performance improvements and, and quantifying them, you know, you can black box it and just, you know, make the change and see what the performance of your benchmark was before and after. If you're looking to quantify the amount of TLB, you know, misses, the, essentially the ratio of hits to the TLB versus misses improvement with huge pages, you can look at um, the output of perf. Uh, we'll show you that. So. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here, uh, we're creating a pod here that uses, that, that, that attempts to consume huge pages. Actually, let me back this up a second here. I want to show you the content of the pod file itself. Sorry for the whiplash here. Okay, here we go. So if you remember the slide before I showed you that said, you know, resources, limits, uh, solarflare.com colon one. Here we've got resources limits, 
uh, huge pages dash 2mi colon 100. So this thing will provide a 100 megabyte volume backed by huge pages to the pod. We'll create the pod. It will eventually run. There it goes. And um, I, I believe we have a, a described node in here as well. See. Yeah. So you can see this pod now and volume are on uh, are on this node which is the one that has the huge pages allocated to it. Yep. Okay, so that's the end of that one as well. I'm closing these as I, uh, as I show them to you. Um, the last two, are, last three demos are about GPUs, which is not necessarily the topic that you might have come here for today, but it's all part and parcel of the same, you know, bit of effort and ecosystem upstream. So I'll work through those, but uh, if they're not in your interest area, go ahead and feel free to drop. Um, they're they're short. We'll, we'll be done in the next 10 minutes, I would say. Um, but also feel free to ask questions whenever you have them. There's there's a, a question from Ryan here about how well to scale with 10 10,000 with 10 100 or even how okay. well do scale? Yeah. Um, so the each individual feature has only been tested up to. Uh, well, I would say this: Huge Pages has, has been tested at up to 2,000 nodes. Um, we don't have a, an environment that has 2,000 nodes that have GPUs in them, so that has not been done. However, NVIDIA themselves told me they tested up to I think 650 nodes with GPUs. Uh, hopefully, that answers your question. Okay, thanks. Um, NVIDIA has a gigantic internal cluster that they use to prove out everything and. And uh, they were able to share with us the size is, is roughly six, I think it was a little, a little over 650. Okay. So let's get started here. Um, someone better than me at graphics, you know, <laughs> played with this video a little. Um, I should mention this, this demo itself was, uh, was done by one of our, was done by me, but the actual content of it was created by uh, Zvonko. And we he blogged about it in OpenShift three nine timeframe I think. Feel free to jump in here, Zvanko, if you can hear us. Um, what you're looking at here is so if you remember before we had the limits solar flare here. If, if I hope you can see this, but the limits nvidia.com slash GPU. Uh, the important piece here is that it's we're requesting two GPUs, so it will only land on nodes that have two GPUs in them. And we're going to show eventually the difference in performance of an image recognition uh, benchmark when we run it on one GPU versus when we run it on two GPUs. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with OpenShift itself, but just the fact that you can get this all running on OpenShift is kind of why we're showing it. Um, it's obviously um, a routine thing for you know machine learning practitioners, but doing it on top of Kubernetes is sort of new. So we've got a pod that's got CAFE2 running and a Jupyter Notebook in it. And this is, this is one of the tutorials that ships with CAFE2. Um, let me pause it here. You can see that one, this is actually just one GPU running. And uh, you can see that it's capable of analyzing uh, roughly 57, 58 images per second. So there's only one GPU being used in this Jupyter Notebook in the back end. Further down, we'll see that, uh, and I'll just pause it here again, we added a second GPU. So this part of the Jupyter Notebook requests or, or actually implements multiple GPUs. Um, and again, these, these tutorials are part of CAFE2, so you can, you can use these yourself. Um, and this capable, it's, it's essentially linearly scaling here, 115 images per second now across two GPUs. And one thing I'll say is that I wouldn't keep those, those absolute numbers in mind. If you, if you ever run any of these benchmarks, you know, and NVIDIA talks about being able to do a thousand on one GPU um, 
uh, in their newest gear. So these are some of the lower end uh, in, uh, GPUs available on Amazon. Um, but again, just proving out the functionality here, not necessarily the raw performance. So yeah, linear scaling improvement there, which is great. Um, any thoughts or questions on that one? I think you keep blowing people's minds here with this, with the scale of things here and the ability to do stuff that um, even a year ago was not really things we thought we would be we'd be talking about today. So Jeremy, can you just say what that deep learning uh, model did? I missed that somehow. Uh, I know it analyzed images. I don't know much more detail than that. Um, so I can't really answer you. Uh, but if you either looked at the example or Ping's Vanko, I'm sure he knows. Okay. Unless he can hear us now. Images so. though. Okay. Image recognition. Okay. I know it did image recognition, but some of the guts and how-to, I do not know. I do not know. Yeah. Uh, another That's message awesome. on the chat here. Yeah, Zvanko is having, having difficulty getting connected and staying connected. So. He may be back in again now. No, no worries. So uh, someone's asking, Peter is asking about links. And um, uh, so when I sent out, or when, when Diane gets a copy of these slides, sure he has a copy actually, uh, all of these demos are linked inside the, inside the deck. Okay, so the next one is, is there another chat? Okay, yeah, you can have copies of all this stuff. Um, okay, so this one is around sys controls, and this one is not GA, Tech Preview in 310. I don't know if it made 111 upstream. I, I think it's still gonna be beta, which may, uh, which, which maybe, maybe, maybe makes, sorry, maybe we can graduate this thing to GA and OpenShift in, in 311, but um, I, I actually have to follow up on that. I don't know. So. This is just a minute long here. Um, just a quick overview. So certain applications require sys controls to be tuned. And one of those, a good example of that is Elasticsearch. Um, it, the, the latest versions of Elasticsearch require certain uh, virtual memory, and I forget the exact sys control, but it won't even start unless you've increased this certain virtual memory tunable. So that's a concrete example of an application that will not run on Kubernetes without being able to tweak these things. Now, when you, whether you do it at the host level or you do it inside a container are two different things. Um, it needs it tuned uh, at the host level. Okay, an OpenShift 3.10 cluster. Um, I'm just showing here quickly that, uh, that a certain, this, this certain sys control is set to one, or sorry, <laughs> it's set to zero by default in RHEL. Here's my template, and I'll quickly pause it here. The, the reason that this thing is not beta yet is because you see the alpha implementation uses annotation. And the process of converting you know, the initial alpha implementation over to beta requires it to move out of annotations into a legitimate field, into a real field within the pod spec. And that's the process uh, that was done by our team over the last couple of months, that's done. I just don't know if it's actually graduated to to beta. So here in the, this is using what's in 3.10, which is still alpha. Um, and you can see here the annotation, the certain sys control is set to one. I'm setting it to one. And this pod is nothing more than a rel, a rel pod that just sleeps. So actually, I've, I've even linked to it there. Um, promoting a sys control alpha annotation to fields is uh, being discussed on GitHub. And I actually think that work is done since I've made this video. So I create the pod. And all we need to do is just double check that inside the pod itself using OC exec or kubectl exec uh, that it has changed. So it was zero before. And you know now you can see it's set to one. So real simple demo, but a powerful feature that will be leveraged by applications that need to change the kernel uh, defaults. 
Uh, Ann, can we ask questions here or do we just use chat? We do. Go ahead and ask the question. Very quick, what, what really strikes me here, are you able to have multiple pods with different kernel parameters running? So here's the thing, and, and it's a, that's a great question. So here's the thing. There are three types of sys controls in Kubernetes land. You have something that you have sys controls that are namespace aware, and there's a very short list of those. You have some that are namespace aware, but not validated as being safe. And those are called unsafe. Uh, Kubernetes calls them unsafe sys controls. And then you've got node level sys controls. So the ones that are namespace aware, you can tweak them on a per pod basis. The ones that are unsafe, you can tweak at a per pod basis, but you have no like contract with the rest of the community that these have been validated as being safe from a kernel standpoint. Um, and you actually need to reconfigure. There's a flag you need to pass to the kubelet to allow uh, unsafe sys controls, and you actually have to provide a, an array of the ones that you want to whitelist at the kubelet level to allow pods to then uh, change those sys controls. And then the third level are the node level sys controls, which are, you know, things like, um, I guess an example is the uh, uh, anything to do with the network. Um, I should say some of the network buffer sizes are are global, are, or sorry, are per interface, I should say, and not namespace aware. Um, most of the memory management subsystem is not namespace aware. So uh, there's those three classes, safe, unsafe, and um, node level. So does that answer your question? Yeah, it's opening up a lot of other questions, but I, I, I will look into that. Uh, I was not aware. Thanks. Yeah, there's there's reasonable documentation on OpenShift or, or, uh, or Kubernetes site about what I just described. Um, unfortunately, this is an area that hasn't had particularly the triage of what what's falls into the safe and unsafe syscontrol area is really just about prioritization. Like if you find a syscontrol that you, we've done this on behalf of customers, they sent us a list of five syscontrols, Red Hat went through and verified that those were safe and then made it possible to tune those uh, upstream. So it's really just a matter of prioritizing. And if it's not possible to do them, to make them namespace aware, then we have a lot of work in front of us um, to make them namespace aware upstream kernel work, which may or may not even be technically possible or even something the kernel community is interested in entertaining. So to handle things like that, we have the node level sys controls and some of these scheduler, like intelligent routing scheduler decisions that I was trying to get across earlier through the extended resources stuff that I showed you in the node capacity to create these nodes that are special in some way. Vonko's benchmark had two nodes in a cluster that were very special, and those had a ton of node level sys controls tuned on them, power management and so forth. Um, so what we did was we we tainted those nodes. I'm, I'm pretty sure he tainted those nodes, which means that you have to have a corresponding toleration on the pod itself in order to get scheduled to those nodes. So essentially nothing runs there unless there's a special flag in the in the pod spec. Um, to protect those precious resources and protect those nodes from having, you know, just a random WordPress running on them when they're running your, you know, your business critical application. I, I haven't talked about paints and tolerations at all today, but that's another important concept that we're going to be using more and more in the product as these hardware features uh, get into production environments. So, Ann, you Safe means that it is um, within the scope of a namespace. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's, that is true. Um, okay. So I'm going to hit play on the, there's only a couple minutes left. Uh, this demo is kind of funky. It shows you how to create your own resource. And let's say you have a resource um, that's unique to your environment that Kubernetes doesn't know about yet, and you want to schedule against it. In this case, I'm talking about, uh, you know, for the demo purposes, the concept of a dongle. Some, some applications have a physical dongle that comes with them. They have to insert in a USB port on the system, and it does some sort of, like, copy protection, you know, to prevent piracy. So what I've done here is um, show, I'll back it up a second, uh, show that this that this 
node capacity and allocatable does not have any knowledge of my dongles yet, right? Uh, so I go ahead and create a pod that wants to have a dongle and it will just sit there in pending state because no, no node on the cluster can provide the three dongles that this pod wants. And again, pod, a dongle could be any precious resource. So it's requesting three and it's just gonna sit there and do nothing because again, there's no there's nowhere in this cluster that this thing could run. Um, so I've got a little script here that adds, for, uh, it updates the capacity and allocatable fields of a node to provide or to publish the availability of 42 dongles. So this node magically set, thinks it has 42 dongles on it now. And if I get the allocatable and uh, capacity fields, you can see here that example.com slash dongle shows you know, just 42 at this point. So that's the that's an example of extending Kubernetes to schedule anything you want. And that's the exact same infrastructure that Huge Pages and the device plugin from NVIDIA or SolarFlare also tie into. Oh, that was really good. That kind of cleared it up. Very neat. Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, so now if I get the list of pods, you can see, you know, now that a node showed up that that could supply the three dongles, uh, now it is now Kubernetes has scheduled the pod to that node and started the uh, started the pod. So that I think is it for the demos for today, guys. Um, yeah, I guess the end here just deleting that resource, just deleting those. Uh, and you can see here in the capacity middle cable, there's no more no more dongles in this cluster. That's it. Uh, I have a question. Okay. So um, earlier during the demo, you uh, said that you did some tuning for the solar flare in order to do the uh, compare the baseline with OpenShift. So how much tuning are we talking about here? And what level of expertise is required? Uh, well, so Red Hat ships a, a, a daemon called TuneD, which includes some profiles in it, which can tune a system. Um, we used a profile called CPU partitioning which creates the, the group of housekeeping cores versus dejittered isolated cores. And so we're trying to really make it super easy to tune a system for a telecom or financial services workload with that profile. All you have to do is tell it which cores are housekeeping and which cores are isolated and reboot the node. And suddenly you have uh, an environment that's tuned for that type of workload. How many customers do you have that have adopted this uh, blueprint or this uh, setup? For, well, so all the stuff today is brand new. I mean, the product just got out the door yesterday. So, oh. so no one yeah. have adopted it yet? No guinea pig yet? Oh, we have some proof of concepts underway. Um, I'm not able to mention names, but we do have some proof of concepts underway for all of this stuff. And uh, certainly there are some customers, you know, even though they're not graduated to GA, um, there, are, there are quite a few customers running GPUs on OpenShift in, in uh, you know, so quite a few. In production? They don't share much uh, in terms of how far they've gone with me personally. You know, maybe some of the product managers at Red Hat have a little bit more of a status. Yeah, update. I think a lot okay, of- Okay, thanks think of it as a competitive advantage and um, are playing their cards closely, but they have been very good at giving us feedback and, and getting that incorporated into, in, into the work that Jeremy and others are doing. I'll see, yeah. if, I'll see if I can track one of them down to um, talk about it publicly as in a briefing at some juncture. Yeah, yeah there, there are product managers working with us on this and maybe they're able to share more, but I, I, I don't know the answer. All right then. Do you have a final slide that you? Yeah, perfect. That you can put up with how to reach you and where everything's. Oh. Um, or you can no. Just go no, back. I do not. Go back to your first one. Um, yeah. So Jeremy, um, thank you very much for today. This is really good. I've been waiting for this one for a while. I, I apologize to Ivanko for not being able to click in and, and speak up at all. So perhaps we'll do another round with um, some other deep dive information from Svanko and in, in the not too distant future.
but um, I will post all of this information along with the slides and the links to the demo um, on blog.openshift.com shortly. And um, it looks um, like there's, there's, there's a lot more um, out there going on um, and we need to get a few, as, as I just mentioned earlier, maybe one, of, one or two of the POC folks to, to talk us through um, their lessons learned in the use cases, because there's lots of different use cases to which this work applies, not just trading platforms. So um, it's very useful information. And, and thank you again, Jeremy, for taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks, Diane.